Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is the third uh, spy night that we've done this spring, and I'm pleased to say that next uh, fall we will com be coming back to the Salt Room uh, with our favorite poet, Sue Ellen Thompson, will be leading it out. And uh, <laughs> maybe she didn't commit to it, but uh, we'll be seeing here. Uh, I can't tell you how grateful I am to the Avalon for having us and, uh, and demonstrating every time we've done this the importance and the power of the spoken word. And so I'm just so grateful for you to be here. Um, the reason Laura Oliver came into our life was because of my long association with the Delmarva Review and Wilson Wyatt as publisher. And, uh, it's important to note that it was because of Wilson that we uh, had our first Sunday columnist, George Merrill. Um, and when, unfortunately, George passed along, I went back to Wilson, and lo and behold, Laura Oliver emerged. And we've been all been incredibly impacted by this, this new voice on the spy. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce Wilson Wyatt, the publisher and editor of the Delmarva Review. Okay, well, I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Dave. It's, um, our relationship with SPY has been terrific. We just published this last November, the 16th issue of the Delmarva Review, and it's We've cut it down to 400 pages, so it's uh, <coughs> something to last for a year or so. Uh, but the, um, uh, I'll go back and talk about Laura for a minute, and then I'll give you some information about her. But it, <coughs> I was the, um, the coordinator of the Beta Ocean Writers Conference for several years, and we had, uh, that's about 150 writers. Do any, are any of you familiar with it? Good. <laughs> I see Laura, so I feel relieved. <laughs> but um, so it's always popular. It always sells out. And it's, it's a very healthy uh, organization. And but we wanted years ago, we wanted to upgrade the level of, of teachers in the conference. It started out here in the Avalon, actually. And it was um, uh, it was interesting because it was all in one room, not 150 people. And the, um, as, the, as the coordinator of the conference, you're always interested in who does well as a teacher uh, in the conference. So you walk around each of the classrooms and check them out. And there were two that were always had a line going outside. And one was Barbara Essman, who is, uh, lives in Virginia and is, is a, very, a very fine writer. Um, and the, uh, but the other one is, was Laura Oliver. And I went in to listen to her lecture, and it was like fighting a crowd to get in. I mean, everyone was sitting in the aisles, and I'm sitting here thinking about the insurance policy. <laughs> <laughs> And 40, 42 people to a classroom, and there were at least 80 uh, in this uh, in this one, and no one's going to leave, you know. So that's, but uh, people were engaged, which is that's what you just to get excited about as a writer or as a teacher. And one thing I've learned in being an editor of the Delmarva Review with the editors that we have for fiction and poetry and nonfiction um, is the teachers really do well as editors. And, um, and so it's, um, that's always exciting. I, I love teachers. I love working with them. And our editors are all teachers. But when Dave came to me and said he needed someone to replace uh, our friend, uh, uh, who, was a non, who was the nonfiction editor of the review and also a, 
a, a priest and counselor here and that a lot of people knew in, in the community. That was going to be hard to do, but it had to be someone who could write, who could engage people, and who knew a lot about storytelling. And I thought right away about, about Laura Oliver. And, um, and so I called her and said, would you be, or talk to, sent an email, of course, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to her, and she said she'd be excited to talk about it. And so we had a conversation. I sent her to Dave, and, and she tried it out, and it worked. Uh, it clicked. So now all she has to do every week is worry about <laughs> what to write, <laughs> and uh, which is which is interesting. Um, but I'd, I'd like I'm going to mention a couple of things about her that you should know. Uh, first of all, are there any writers in the room? Anyone who wants to be a writer? <laughs> okay. Anyone who wants to be a writer, um, Laura's in the back of the room, and she'll be here. Uh, in the front, and you should engage her <laughs> uh, if you're interested in writing a book, if you're write, interested in writing a story. Um, she, she is very, very good about putting together the elements of a story, and that's why when I went, went around that Beta Ocean Writers Conference and, and saw that line, that's why there were so many people lined up. And, um, and that's, a, that's a tough thing. Everyone can say I can write a story. Uh, that's just not. That's just not true. I'm sorry. <laughs> and and I and I read several thousand every year. <laughs> um, the um, but Laura also is an author of a book called called The Story Within, which there are four or five good writing books that a writer who's interested in in learning um, should get. The first one is Bird, Bird by Bird uh, by Anne Lamott, which is the most famous one. Uh, but <clears throat> this also is one of the, one of the more famous ones. And uh, Laura wrote the book, and a lot of writers know, know her because of it. Uh, so that's, that's the first. I learned about her through another, <clears throat> another editor and writer um, that I was, who's a friend of mine who writes fiction and he was involved with St. John's and that's where uh, Laura taught uh, <clears throat> among other places. She also taught at the Writers' Center. I was on the board of the Writers' Center for several years. It's a great organization and she teaches one, once, uh, once or twice a month um, at the Writers' Center. And so does, so does Sue Ellen Thompson and, and, and others that you, you probably know. Um, the other is the, that um, she, is, she won the Maryland State Arts Council Individual Artist Award in Fiction. And I wanted to mention that. I had to read that because it's a long title. And there's also one in, in um, Delaware. It's a similar title, but slightly different. And every year, that's, uh, that's a pretty special honor if you're a writer. Uh, to get that to get that award, so I will. Um, I think I've said enough about the about the the good the good qualities of um, of Laura, and you'll um, you're in for a treat. I always am. We don't have uh, all the all the writers standing in the corridors, uh, so it's going to be a lot more pleasant to listen to. <laughs> <coughs> Laura. Mm -hmm. self-positioned here. <laughs> Short legs, high stool. <laughs> thank you all for coming and thank you so much um, Wilson and thank you to Dave for hiring me, for giving me the privilege of writing stories every week. <clears throat> um, 
to everyone who's connected with the SPY and to WHCP, um, where I have the privilege of reading stories on the air every week. I'm just so, so grateful. Um, I was going to start with the second story I ever sent in to the SPY. So this goes back two years, because it's been that long of writing stories every week. And it's called Good Enough. When I was little, I was convinced that if my belief was strong enough and my motives were pure, I would be able to walk right off the end of the pier and not sink. I'd step off the garage roof and fly, sail off the rope swing over the river at Scott's Ravine and be suspended in the hand of God. If I were truly a good person, every bit of me from the inside out, I'd be able to heal Billy Wilkins, who was in my fifth grade class at Lakeshore Elementary. Billy was swimming in the river one Saturday in mid-May, before the sea nettles had drifted in from the bay, when his uncle ran over him with a powerboat. It was actually a wooden rowboat with a 25 horsepower outboard. Billy was in a coma and going to die. So his desperate parents called their priest, who strode into the ICU and commanded, Billy, wake up. And Billy did, just like that. Billy returned to Mrs. Tidings' class a month later with a jagged, raw scar that disappeared into his blonde hairline. And now he spoke with great effort. His left arm dangled as if it were pinned to his shoulder. It seemed to have shrunk and he dragged his left foot slightly sideways, like a bird with a broken wing. My heart broke every time I looked at him across the classroom. He sat along the bulletin board wall beneath the pictures of the presidents. I sat by the windows where I could see the blacktop. A few weeks later, school let out for the summer. One July Sunday after church, my father called up the stairs to my room where I was changing to play clothes and told me I had a visitor. We lived out in the country with few houses around, and I hadn't heard the crunch of car tires in the lane, so I was shocked to discover Billy shuffling in place on our concrete porch. He said hi and smiled without looking at me from beneath the silky hank of dark blonde hair that hung in his eyes. The pink petunias my mother had planted in a large square bed next to the porch watched us in silence. Behind him, wild plum bushes shouldered up to the woodpile, tenderly embracing our encounter as I stepped out to meet him. Sweaty and purposeful and immensely pleased with his accomplishment, he had limped over two miles down Eagle Hill Road by himself. I didn't know what he wanted or why he had come. I was both afraid of and drawn to his damage. I was both flattered and ashamed to have been singled out. We sat cross-legged on the spiky dry grass of midsummer and watched bees bob on white clover blossoms while I thought of ways to say I had to go inside and Billy haltingly constructed one thought at a time. I glanced at his skinny arm and imagined it growing healthy and strong at my touch. I imagined laying my palms over his crippled leg and Billy shouting with joy as he stood straight and strong. The instinct to heal was innate and intense. It had been present all my life. This instinct to place my hands on the woman in the wheelchair at the Glen Burnie bus station, the drunk crumpled on the sidewalk of a Baltimore street corner. But I was an anxious 10-year-old. I worried about failing. I worried about succeeding and becoming full of myself. I worried about wasps trapped on my bedroom window screens, math quizzes, and leprosy. <laughs> I worried about having to marry Billy just to be polite. After Billy's visit, I had a dream I wanted to tell someone, I'll tell you. I was watching the sunset over the pasture behind our house, a blaze of rose, orange, and gold. 
Suddenly, the hand of God descended right through the clouds. I don't know what else it could have been or how else to describe it. It just stayed there, poised over the neighboring lane and the bordering locust trees, the burden of their sweet white blossoms hanging over the plank fence my father had built. In my dream, I witnessed this remarkable event from my bedroom window, sitting on my circus animal bedspread with the ball fringe. God's hand was huge, and it just stayed there without explanation. There was nothing to prove, no test to pass, as if maybe, just maybe, I was already good enough. Looking back, I think that if it had been turned palm down, it would have been a blessing, a benediction over the whole bright and broken world. But it was extended palm up, which seemed to imply an invitation of some kind, not just for me, but for everyone. A possibility suspended over the world like a held breath. Maybe there's a desire to heal others and all of us, to instinctively reach out to make each other whole, to step off the edge of our fear of failure and fly. Thank you. So this next piece, it was really hard to pick pieces. <laughs> I had over 100, and they were all dear to me. So I tried to throw in some variety, at least in setting, if nothing else. Um, and so this next piece takes place in England, where I go frequently because I have a daughter who lives there. It's called Shake It Off. And it's actually about how the veneer of civility disappears so quickly when challenged. And it explores the question, do we have to learn to like everybody? <laughs> Shake it off. Yesterday, I took my rescue terrier, Leah the Wonder Dog, to the dog park at Greenbury Point, the site of one small victory for mankind, one giant loss for the man. Congress just ruled that the Navy could not commandeer Greenbury Point to create yet another private golf course. Greenberry will remain open to the public that loves it. Off leash in the play yard enclosure, Leah ran, ran like the wind, flying across the grass like a pilot practicing touch and go landings. I ran too to encourage her to exercise, but as she flew joyously toward me, I flashed back to a similar scenario running in South Sea Commons, Portsmouth, England last spring. I ran through a nearly empty park. Broad, grassy areas defined by tree-lined avenues are bordered by hotels and restaurants on one side and the sparkling Solent on the other. As I passed South Sea Castle, I noticed a woman walking a smallish white and gold dog off-leash on the far side of the commons. It was against the law, but I understood the temptation. There were no other dogs around and few people. I was deeply into my playlist, AirPods in, listening to Ed Sheeran, imagining myself beautiful, not ordinary, fast, not a 12-minute miler, hair loose in the wind, not in a ponytail. Oh, stop it, at least I admit it. <laughs> and for an instant, as the dog turned away from his owner and began to run toward me, I had a vision of two lovers running through an empty field toward each other in slow motion, arms open wide. Taylor Swift came on as I passed the D-Day Memorial, and now I was shaking it off, running faster, getting cooler, and quite possibly younger by the minute as the dog closed in. As he approached, I could see he had the square head of a Scotty, the wide jaw of a pit, and probably weighed 40 pounds. Missing my own dog, I sent the pup bounding exuberantly over the grass a surge of goodwill when you can't be with the dog you love. On a runner's high, the dog yards from me now, I realized we were going to intersect, and I beamed my affection at this white and gold missile, my Leah stand-in, whom I loved by proxy. I slowed so we could greet each other, just as he hurtled himself toward me and sunk his teeth into my calf. <laughs> 
I shrieked, stopped by 40 pounds of dog attached to my right leg like an anchor, and shocked at Payne's intrusion into my romanticized moment. At this point, his owner, a British woman about my age, huffed up calling out, Oh, Toasty, don't do that. <laughs> oh, my gosh, I exclaimed. Your dog just bit me. I stood there in shock, a bit disoriented, mano a mano with a panting Toasty who now looked a bit malevolent close up. Hey, 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 who's toast now, he seemed to say. <laughs> he bit me, I repeated somewhat stupidly, balancing my weight on my left leg. The owner looked at me calmly. No, he didn't, she said. We stared at each other. Toasty doesn't bite. <laughs> like hell he doesn't, I said, still balancing on my good leg. Then I said something worse, a lot worse. <laughs> oh, you're American. <laughs> she bent down to pet the toaster. That's right, I said suddenly insanely and in inappropriately proud for no reason at all except, and I'll just say it, who was first to the moon. <laughs> and you don't have to be crude, she admonished me. Show me. Pain, fear, and injustice broke down a lifetime of propriety and I exclaimed, what? I don't have to prove it to you. Your freaking dog just sunk his teeth into my calf. But I canted my leg toward her so we could both inspect the perfect crescent of canine teeth marks eight inches above my right ankle. She glanced down, then looked directly back into my face. Toasty didn't do that, she repeated. <laughs> now I was in a small rural town where the cops plant evidence and the judge is corrupt, where all the citizens are in on the creepy conspiracy to convince you of an altered state of reality and they've impounded your car. How about this, I said, shaking now, wondering why my own anger was scary. She was as calm as the queen. How about we find a policeman and ask him what he thinks? I looked pointedly at a sign requiring dogs to be leashed. She glanced around the empty park and said, in her British accent, Well, darling, you can try. But she turned away quickly and, with Toasty by her side, set off down the avenue in the opposite direction. I had no recourse but to limp along after them with my burgeoning case of rabies and onset of hydrophobia or continue my run home where I could scrounge for hydrogen peroxide. Why hadn't I taken a picture of the perpetrator? I had my phone. I could have posted his little mugshot on every telephone pole in South Sea. <laughs> Toasty. Bites. Instead, I took a photo of my leg with its rainbow arc of punctures and progressively purpling bruise as what? Proof to myself I'd been victimized? It is shocking how little it took for me to lose my manners. I'm a bit alarmed at how fast I devolved, how thin the veneer was between tourist and, well, gunslinger. <laughs> she didn't look back as she hurried away, clearly the more culturally composed of the two of us, but could she also have been as scared as I was angry? Or scared because I was angry? I'm still looking for a point of empathy, a story I can imagine that will make this okay. So I tell myself, an Englishwoman and I both love South Sea Commons, and we both love dogs. And from that, I can extrapolate, we both love our kids and our friends. In fact, in another era, we might have been handmaid to gentlewoman, servants at the same court. In another circumstance, there along the ancient Solent, we might have been friends. But I read a book lately with a whole chapter on it being okay not to like somebody. <laughs> that learning to love everyone is not a requirement of the universe although I think it is. <laughs> this is why I'm still trying not to feel like a colonial upstart victimized by a subject of the queen. Is it really okay not to like someone and leave it that way? Surely the answer is to just try harder. Isn't that the American way? I may be laughing now, but as she disappeared near South Sea Castle, I was still spoiling for a fight. 
I wanted to yell after her, Hey, Toasty's mom, forget the moon. Who won the revolution, darling? (laughs) Thank you. So this next story, um, this explores a feeling I've been born with, which is probably the genesis of all my writing, just a sense of homesickness for something or someone I can't identify, perhaps maybe never had, and maybe you'll relate. This one takes place in New Zealand, where we lived for a time. It's called Country of Origin. I want an old house with a lot of windows, I said, when I agreed to move to New Zealand for three years. I was in the bargaining stage of grief, excited at the prospect, but sad to leave the life I loved for such a long time. I was being a supportive partner, coming off a successful Stars and Stripes campaign, the children's father had been offered the job of a lifetime designing New Zealand's America's Cup entry. There was only one answer to the question, hey, how would you feel about living 12,000 miles away from home for the next three years? And it wasn't not great. It's going to be fun, my youngest of three, then eight-year-old Emily exclaimed, mommy, did you know there are no snakes in New Zealand? Right, I thought. No extended family, no job that I love, no friends, but here's a plus, no snakes. No wonder. Any further south, they'd have slithered to Antarctica. (laughs) The next day, I stood in the shed contemplating what gardening tools I might need to ship to Auckland. What grows in New Zealand, I wondered. Not the white lilacs I planted by the kitchen window 15 years ago. Not the pink hollyhocks that grace the white picket fence in the backyard. What's the time difference, friends asked. I said, count eight hours backwards and make it tomorrow. But no one wrote that down. You cross the international date line, I added for interest. Coming back, you can travel for 24 hours, but you arrive the day you left. I looked around brightly at the impassive faces around me. You're as good as dead, I thought. As long as you have each other, my mother kept saying. That's all that really matters. I thought about missing autumn mornings in Maryland and eyed my family with a new sense of detachment. The house we found was what New Zealanders call an old villa, a turn of the century, two-story Victorian, built into a hillside that overlooked Rangitoto, a dormant volcano rising from endless miles of the Haraki Gulf and the Pacific beyond. There was a patio where we could have barbecues, Barbies, without being too bothered by the mosquitoes, mozzies. Everything in that tiny country was somehow referred to in the diminutive. It made me feel American in a kind of grand and aggressive way, like I should have been wearing a cowgirl hat coming through immigration, emblematic of wide open plains, massive selections at the grocery store, supersized dinner portions, and a tendency to share intimacies at the local coffee shop with a total lack of discretion. But also emblematic of big, warm, gregarious hearts, quick to befriend strangers with a smile and to instinctively extend a hand to shake. Agapanthus flourished in the garden. Purple and white flowers seemed to glow at dusk, and Emily's treehouse overlooked the gulf. She could play outside almost year-round due to the temperate climate, but at night, when we gathered on the porch and listened to the cicadas, it was not the North Star overhead, but the Southern Cross, and it did not point the way home. One day, as I was writing at my desk and Emily was constructing a lily pond in the lettuce crisper for a salamander, I noticed a cloud of bees swarming in huge gusts up and down behind the agapanthus, I called Mr. Oliver to come see. Those look like German wasps, he said. They can be dangerous. You better call someone. The next afternoon, the bee man arrived. He donned a white suit complete with a hood that reached down to his shoulders, pants, and a top with Velcro closures at the wrists. I went up onto the high veranda to watch as he disappeared behind the bushes with his apparatus. Only an occasional flailing branch told me he was still there, 
but the bees began breaking formation, and a few began flying around the yard in crazy orbits, dive-bombing me on the porch where I'd yelp and duck involuntarily. I felt sad for them for a moment, their sense of community and continuity disrupted, their sense of safety displaced. After a few more minutes, the bee man emerged and joined me on the porch. Will they die? I asked. Or will they simply move to a new home? Well now, nothing stays the same forever, the bee man said, apropos of absolutely nothing. His words were softened by the beautiful, lilting accent with which all New Zealanders speak. Every sentence is a musical phrase that goes up a few notes at the end. It makes even a simple declaration of fact sound like a question. Nothing stays the same forever. Take off of that hood. Are you the bee man or a messenger? That's the thing about feelings, I'd been reminded. Like circumstances, they don't stay the same forever. Would I spontaneously hug him with unseemly gratitude when he left? Yep, American to the core. I turned this story into my instructor, Alice Madison at Bennington's MFA program. I was flying up from New Zealand every six months for several weeks on the Vermont campus with other MFA candidates. Manuscript in hand, she frowned at me from beneath her ball cap and through huge picture window glasses. I gazed at my copy of the story, jet lagged and stressed out. Oh, wait! She looked back down and studied the manuscript an excruciating moment longer. This was a woman who not only had several critically acclaimed novels, she also wrote regularly for The New Yorker. I get it, she exclaimed. You're the bee. I, I squirmed a bit. <laughs> now that she had put it that way, it sounded stupid. I was most certainly not the bee. I'd rather die than be the bee now. I'd been going for subtle symbolism. Turning fact into fiction was proving difficult in this program, but yes, my hive had been disrupted. And yes, I was homesick, but I think I've always been. I think we're all a little homesick. I sometimes think our lives are all about assuaging the feeling that we are on temporary visas here. We fall in love, make children and homes, find our calling, love the best we can, and it's enough until sometimes it isn't, and it all feels like sightseeing. The world is a fascinating place to visit, but aren't there times when you sense your spiritual passport doesn't state your country of origin? That when you eventually arrive back home, you'll discover it's the day you left. The bee man was right, of course. Nothing stays the same. That's why joy must come from the inside out an energy powered by love that is impervious to circumstances because circumstances are just the setting for your life. For a time, mine was New Zealand. But the story of your life is what you make of it. And the brilliance of life's design is that you never go backward. You never leave a time, a place, or a person with less. With every change, you take something good with you into the next unknown. Even when the distance between then and now is so great, you must count eight hours backward and make it tomorrow. Thank you. This is next story it takes place in Annapolis. And it's a story about my search for revelation, insight, healing, which is perpetual. I've tried meditation, singing bowls, yoga, hypnosis, to name a few. But this was something new. This story is called Unbidden. Sophie, the robin, who has been sitting on three blue eggs in a pink dogwood just outside my office window, abandoned ship last night. The nest was magnificent structure. To make the interior soft and bowl-shaped, she had pressed her rounded breast into the grass and twigs she'd gathered and painstakingly plastered with mud. She shaped it like a potter might use his hands. Only Sophie Bird had used her heart. 
A crow discovered the nest two days ago and swept in for repeated attacks. I'd warded off two assaults myself, but I knew the crafty crow, a hulking black shadow, a menace to all small things that sing, would inevitably succeed in his lethal mission. And he did. Yes, Sophie was one of a billion robins, collectively known as a worm of robins, like a pride of lions or a murder of crows. And yes, statistics indicate that only 25% of birds fledged in summer make it even to fall. But she was a good mother, or at least the best she could be. And that kills me. The good wasn't good enough. Self-improvement was a major theme in the house of my childhood, and I need to get a handle on this. Good never feels good enough. Remorse never feels deep enough. And you cannot be grateful enough for the gifts you've been given. I won't argue with that last one. I was thinking about these things lying in a float tank, a sensory deprivation chamber. I signed up for this hour session somewhat impulsively because I'd always been curious what on earth would happen if I turned off my brain. I'd heard that the experience is unique and lends itself to emotional insight, healing, and spiritual revelations. I'm not known for low expectations. <laughs> I arrived for my session in a ponytail and no makeup. I was going to be in water up to my ears for an hour and then showering off the Epsom salts that would make me as buoyant as a balloon. So the normal morning routine had been swapped out for dear God, don't let me run into anybody I know. The float chamber itself had been a stunning surprise. If you've ever been to a grotto, like the one on the Isle of Capri, where the sunlight seems to shine upwards from the white sea floor, making the water pristine blue and alive with light. It was like that. As if blue and light had somehow merged to become a living thing. And the ceiling of the float chamber was covered in glittering stars. We know I was charmed. After taking a peek into it from my private outer room and having showered at home, I got undressed and then opened the chamber door and lowered myself into water the color of the sky and the temperature of my skin. When ready, I could push a button with a wet, salty hand to turn out the chamber lights so that only the stars lit the darkness. But I'd been advised to use a second button to eventually turn out the stars as well. Floating in the absence of light, as if in the womb, would provide the ultimate float experience. <clears throat> I lay there, reluctant to relinquish the stars. They are themselves evidence of a living universe, but I did eventually hit the button in search of the greater experience. The water held me just as it must have held me in the womb. I could open my eyes, and there was no difference in having them shut. I was sightless, sort of weird, sort of utero, except I probably wasn't thinking thoughts in the womb. Okay, that's a lie, I probably was. <laughs> but I was definitely still thinking thoughts here. I wanted to turn my brain off, but I came to understand that my internal mental chatter was not the result of outside stimuli. With all external stimuli eliminated, my mind monkeys were having a barn dance and had invited rowdy friends on scooters. <laughs> I tried concentrating on my breathing and on the water itself, which some call silky, not slimy. But after what I determined to be about 40 minutes, with deadly accuracy, as it turns out, I resorted to amusing myself. What would happen if I put my feet down? Make the water ripple. Hey, if I died and suddenly became limp, in what position would they find my body? My hands seemed to always float to my hips like Wonder Woman, like someone who died bossing everyone around. I had earplugs in, but I could feel water seeping in around them, and I started worrying that I was getting salt crystals in my ears. I tried harder to find heaven. Where was the spiritual revelation, the emotional insight, the healing? I've got conundrums, and I'd provided the blankest slate I could muster to no avail. After a while, I started pinging myself off the sides of the tank, floating from left to right, pushing off with my toes. I was a float fail. I tanked. 
the float tank experience. <laughs> the times I have been graced by the presence of spirit have come unbidden, have descended like a cloud, like the night before surgery when I'd been waiting three weeks in excruciating anxiety for a specialist from Georgetown to join my surgeon at Anne Arundel Medical for a procedure so involved it would take three hours. I was awakened that night by gratitude, a soft, living presence that entered the room as gently as light, flooding my body and saturating my being so thoroughly that I could only lie in the dark and weep for the reality of a living love. I lay there just ridiculous with gratitude because I knew that if my surgery revealed the presence of a terminal illness, it would somehow be the experience I was born for. I didn't feel assured that I would not be sick, only that if I were, all was well, all was perfect. Sometimes God has arrived in a flash of intuition where I suddenly knew something I could not possibly know. Spirit has shown up as someone I'm meeting for the first time who feels like home. But God has never arrived when I was looking, or testing, or bargaining. Instead, God has always materialized in ways I cannot anticipate. Do you search for the air you breathe? That's the way love manifests, I thought, lying there in the primal dark. Grace is a presence for whom you can only open the door. And with that revelation, I turned on the stars. And I have one more. <laughs> I just thought I would close with this. Um, maybe it's something that you have seen, or maybe it's something that you'll be able to relate to. This is called Look With Your Eyes, See With Your Heart. Have you seen this? An unshaven man in crumpled khakis and a worn shirt sits cross-legged on a cold DC street corner with a tin cup at his feet. In his hands, he grips a square of cardboard upon which he has printed, I'm blind, please help. Well-dressed professionals clip past in their Stuart Weitzman and Cole Hans on their way to professional jobs in plush offices with fake ficus trees in accent-lit lobbies. Pretty women pause, dig in shiny shoulder bags, then toss in a quarter. Other passers-by rush on, eyes averted. A slim young woman with dark hair pulled back in a bun, maybe 18 or 19, passes the man as well, but stops and turns back. Kneeling in front of him, she gently pulls the cardboard from his hands, extracts a marker from her backpack, and flips his sign over. As the bewildered man waits, unable to see what she's doing, she scrawls a new message on the reverse side, hands the sign back and walks on. Over the course of the day, elapsed in YouTube time, people stream past the blind man as before, except now, nearly everyone stops to place cash in his cup. Coins drop like rain, a flood of thoughtful compassion. The afternoon wears on, and the perplexed man continues to hold up the sign the woman has written. His cup overflows. As shadows lengthen at the end of the business day, the woman returns from the opposite direction. When she greets him, the man recognizes her voice. What did you do to my sign? He asks helplessly. He is confused by his new success, the magic of what she has done. She responds, I wrote the same thing, but in different words. As the camera pans out, the sign becomes visible in black block print, the girl has written, it's a beautiful day and I can't see it. Words change everything. Luck, energy, desire, vision, the way you see the world and those with whom you share it. 
Last Christmas, I had one of those circle of friend candle holders on my coffee table, only the friends were three elves facing inwards, their little backs to the observer, holding hands around a lit votive. As I moved them to put a pizza down, I mentioned to my friend Rick that the little guys appeared to be circled around the glow of a burning log in a cold forest. Rick, whose job description includes words like covert, pentagon, and flight schedule, said dispassionately, yeah, I think they're hiding something. <laughs> Perspective. Like everything else, it's a story we tell ourselves based on our experience of the past. But that doesn't make it true, nor a prediction of what's to come. My three kids have lived all over this country and all over the world, and I have missed them. My son left home at 17 to live in New Zealand for more than a decade. One daughter lived in New Orleans for years, then Vermont. Another daughter moved to the United Kingdom 12 years ago, and I can't imagine she will ever live closer than an ocean away. I have missed weddings and births. Friends with kids nearby have felt sorry for me. I felt sorry for me, too. Then I wrote the same story, but with different words. The kids are happy. They call home. They've created meaningful lives. They have found people they love. It's a beautiful day, and I can see it. Thank you. So that's it, except for the, the 20 more tucked away. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I think I'm supposed to ask if anybody has any questions about anything. Writing process, stories, yeah. I'm curious, do you always write in the first person? Um, I do always write. Um, the question was, do you always write in the first person? And I do always write in the first person for these, because these pieces for the spy are all personal essay. So it's all written from the eye and from the eye. Yeah. But I write fiction as well, and sometimes the fiction is third person, although a lot of it's first person too. Um, it helps me access the actual emotion of the time, since most of my fiction has some autobiographical um, core to it. So anybody else? Yeah. We may have met many years ago. Your essays, you talk about Lakeshore. Did you graduate from Northeast High School? Yes. Okay. Well, I was, <laughs> and I don't get too personal, but I was a teacher there in the 1970s. Wow. Like, uh, 69 to 75. So I didn't know whether that was the time you were there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> did you say 80? <laughs> what, what did you teach? <laughs> hmm. uh, well, my, name, uh, my maiden name was Irwin, but my uh, married name was Dutrow. I got married in the huh. 70s. So, I, I, that's so interesting. My, my actual, my, um, at least my senior year English teacher was black, so I know she wasn't you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, yes, she was awesome. Oh, she was awesome, yes. <laughs> that's amazing. I know, but I could tell little things that you wrote. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I did. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. Weird full circle moment. <laughs> Anybody else? Any questions, observations, anything you want to do with your own writing? Any questions about that process? Everybody's got a story. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> do you enjoy writing more or, or uh, teaching more? I love the energy exchange in teaching. Um, and I, I like that exchange when I'm working with people one-on-one -on -one as well. That's really important to me. But honestly, it's the writing. You know, when I'm, when I'm writing and in the zone, I'm up in my office and I'm laughing and I'm crying, you know, and I'm all by myself, you know. And um, I, it's like the icing on the cake. And when I have to put it aside to edit other people's work or to prepare a workshop, that's kind of the thing I need to do to make a living, but 
the icing on the cake is getting back to writing. I want to do a, a new edition of the story within the Penguin Random House published that, but I retain the rights, so I can do a new edition of that um, and update it and release it again. And I think that's probably one thing that will come out. And then I would like to publish a collection of personal essays. So it's just finding the time to look for an agent. Um, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so the question was, when you have to write um, one story a week for the spy, do you write several at a time and then you can kind of put them out? And the answer is, I am so unbelievably grateful when I can come up with one a week. <laughs> um, every Monday is my writing day. I carve out Mondays. I protect it from lunch with friends, from doctor's appointments. Monday is writing day. And I literally, literally pray for inspiration that day because I have no idea on Monday morning what I will be turning in on Friday. So I have pretty much five days, which I'm working full time that whole time. So I try to write on Monday and by noon, I hope I have a draft with a heartbeat. And I usually know. Um, and then I have to put it aside and start editing and drop back into it, which is something I learned to do writing with young children. Um, it was good training ground. Um, people who think, and maybe you guys think this, that you need vast swaths of uninterrupted time to write, and I find that's the kiss of death. Um, you do more when you've got more to do. And um, when I first started writing seriously, it was when I had three kids and one was a baby and I was like trapped in the house, but I could write while the baby slept. You know, I could write while the spaghetti water boiled. And I learned to drop in and out. So that's the answer to that. Yes. Okay, so that question started out about how gifted I am. <laughs> and then <laughs> the question was about, sort of about process, like when you start, do you know where you're going? And I'm glad you asked that, actually, because that was the most important mandate in the book I wrote, The Story Within, which was to anybody who wants to write, you don't have to know where you're going in order to begin. I never have a clue where an essay is going to land. I don't know what it's about. It's a completely intuitive process. So what I will do is I have learned to pay attention to what you pay attention to, to what, what captures you. And if I, on Monday morning, think, well, there can't possibly be anything in this story about the cat running away, but I will honor the fact that I thought of it. I'm going to place my faith in the fact that it wouldn't have come to mind if there weren't something there possibly for me. And so I'll just start to tell the concrete story. You know, we had two cats. They were both named Kimmy. What's up with that? Why did we name the second cat the same thing as the first cat? You know, and what happened to Kimmy? They said she ran away, but you know. Um, and I don't know what that's about. And so I just start to tell the concrete story the story of what happened. And then this process that writers go through, and I'm sure poets do as well, is that the metaphor starts to emerge and you start to understand what the story is really about and how it is that what happened is what mattered. And that's always a surprise to me. And I'm always really grateful when it lands and I know 
there's that sigh of relief on Monday afternoon. Got it. It's going to be refined 100 times between then and Friday morning when I turn these in. But at least I know it lives, you know. <laughs> I don't have to do CPR in it. Do you have to live within a certain word count? No. I have Dave Whelan to thank for the fact that when I <laughs> said, how long does it have to be, he said, however long, you know, it takes to take the story. My personal feeling is, however, that people have short attention spans and a lot of people read on their phones. So I try to land these at about 1,000 words, you know, never more than 1,200 or so. Um, pretty consistently, and that's why. Um, anybody else? Yeah. Um, if I can follow up just on the Sure. Is any piece ever really finished? And, and if you ever go back to something, don't you always change it? You know, they're finished as far as coming to the point that I wanted to make. But finished as far as being perfect? No. Mm -hmm. Never. And I read that Toni Morrison said that, that even after something is published, she's, she's fixing it. And I completely empathize with that. You always see a word that, ah, oh, you could have done better. Always. Um, you had a hand up it right in front of him. Yes, I was wondering, because I, I love the positive aspects of what you write and your spiritual quest. And I wondered what, what books you have on your night table. <laughs> Okay, she asked me what books I have on my night table. And um, so the truth is, <laughs> I have a phone on my night table, and all the books are on Audible, <laughs> and I listen to them. <laughs> I read all day long, and I can't, just can't do it. You know, people send me stuff to read for fun. You know, I wrote this 50 page story, and I thought you'd like it, so I'm sending it to you for fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, the truth is I listen more than I read nowadays, and that's why. And as to what, um, I read a lot of books on spirituality, um, psychology, history, neuroscience. Um, those are just things that interest me. Physics, well, I have probably 50 on the quantum. <laughs> so that's kind of what I do. But I fall asleep pretty quickly. So. That's why I don't know much. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, Sue, Ellen. Um, you mentioned that you studied at Bennington, got your MFA there with Alice Madison. Um, were there any other teachers or writers who were really influential and formative for you? Yeah, actually. Um, so I asked about Bennington and what other teachers besides Alice Madison were formative for me. Um, and one person who had a lot of impact was Amy Hempel. And uh, Amy writes, um, she wrote a beautiful short story called In the Cemetery Where Al Jolson Was Buried. And it's about the chimp Coco that was one of the first chimps that was learned to sign with her hands. And um, she had like a huge vocabulary. And um, she ran this two themes of having her best friend die and this chimp whose baby died. And the chimp could only sign, come baby play, come baby ball, inarticulate in the language of grief. And it was a beautiful story. And I worked with uh, Amy. Um, and she, she has a very succinct style. Sometimes it's too encoded. You know, I think a lot of people, when I've assigned her stories, are kind of going, what? What's that about? Um, but she influenced me a lot and, and well. Um, Betsy Cox, whose husband was C. Michael Curtis, he was fiction editor of The Atlantic for years. She was influential only in that I wrote my, a short story called um, Ant Farm for her. And she said, I think you should submit this to Glimmer Train. Glimmer Train at the time was turning down people who'd even published in The New Yorker. And, um, and I did, and they took it. And so that was a huge, huge boon to my to my confidence. I don't think I published another piece of fiction for like five years, but it helped. Anybody else? Oh, yes, sorry. sorry. Hey, hey, hi. <laughs> um, one of the things we talked about was the um, moving from memoir to fiction. Mm -hmm. And um, can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, it's so hard for me. Yeah, yeah, we did talk about that. The, the question is, how do you do you move from memoir to, to fiction? Um, I was writing nothing but essays about things that mattered to me. I'd been writing copy 
for ad campaigns and advertising copywriting, and I couldn't write one more brochure about graffiti removal systems. And so I went to all of my clients and said, don't call me for two years. I'm going to write from the heart and see what happens. So I started writing essays about my kids, about marriage, about love, about everything. And um, then it, those were fairly successful. But at one point I thought, I need the freedom of fiction. I don't need every single person in the world knowing everything that goes on in my life. Let's just call her Mary, you know. <laughs> Mary has a problem. Um, so I went to graduate school to learn to do that, to write fiction. And it was very hard for me because all my fiction is autobiographically based. I only know how to get to a story from a place of emotional truth and reality, and then it takes off, and I invent all kinds of things. Um, but that was hard, because for a while I felt like an imposter. I felt like I'm writing the real thing, and now here I'm going to veer off into fiction, and everyone knows this is where it got fake, you know, this is where the story went off the rails, and this part isn't as good because it's not true. It took me two years of working with really fine writers to get truly comfortable with, that's okay. It's okay to write fiction that is autobiographically based or has some piece of truth in it. Um, even if the truth is something as minor as my youngest daughter ran cross country. So I took that experience and gave it to three young boys who were competing in a cross country race. So, but the emotions were, were true. Yeah. You know, that's. Yeah, well, uh, I spent a lot of time running from point to point on the cross country trails. <laughs> I did learn that you can't say things like, take out 22. <laughs> You're supposed to cheer for everybody's kid. Um, still evolving. But um, your, 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 que <laughs> your question was what? <laughs> yes. Glad you asked that, because I am only newly enamored of research. And, um, and yes, I do. And a lot of times when I'm stuck writing an essay for Dave Whelan, um, there will be some element in it that I think I already know a lot about. You know, I think I know about, you know, this comet that's due to come through our solar system. But just in case, I will start to research it. And it is magic. I can't tell you how magic it is to actually know that you don't know anything. And you start to research, and all kinds of new facts come out. And embedded in those new facts are fabulous, poetic, beautiful metaphors and similes. So yeah, I've become a huge fan of research. Anybody else? Yeah. When will the great Laura novel within emerge? Oh, wow. I, that's a tough one um, because I, I just keep thinking about it. <laughs> and I did call up all of the files. Penguin gave me back all of my story files. So I have them all sitting there. And they're open on my computer. Um, I, I would think it'll take me at least, at least another six months before I would even have something to, again, say. I, I think I might just publish that. Uh, I'm not go looking for an agent or anything because... It's an extension of a book published by Penguin Random House, so I figure that gives it credibility. So, maybe. Anybody else? Yes. Do you write poetry? That's so, such a good question. Do I write poetry? I started out with poetry. My mother was a poet, uh, a published poet and a therapist, and so I grew up with that kind of sensibility. And I did write poetry and publish poetry very early on. Um, Poetry wasn't, at the time, <laughs> the sexy genre. It was kind of the, um, yeah, yeah, you know? <laughs> well, let's face it, novels are the sexy ones, you know? And um, it took me a while to get over that, too. Um, but I loved it and studied it in college. And um, I do have some clients that write poetry now. I tell them they should call Sue Ellen. <laughs> but... Um, so I, I, I do do some, but, but not much. It's mostly fiction, short stories, and, uh, and memoir pieces and essays. Anybody else? Yeah? When you're working on fiction, do you read fiction? 
when you're working on essays, do you read essays? What different writers have different things that they read? Yeah, the question is, do you write? Do you read fiction when you're writing fiction? Do you read nonfiction when you're writing nonfiction? Um, I read both a lot all the time, but to your point, yes, I really believe what goes in is what comes out, and that. And I advise writers this way all the time: read the kind of things you want to write. Read in similar voices. Um, read the things that inspire you. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I will definitely pay attention to what I'm reading before I write in a broad scale, not, not for these um, weekly columns. So for those, I just have to go inside. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you for coming. Oh. <laughs>